Hi. Good day, everybody. Um, good morning, afternoon, evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I am Dr. Suresh Venkatesan. I'm the chairman and CEO of Poet Technologies. And, um, you know, I want to provide you with a, with a short, you know, update on, on the company and what we've achieved over the past year. Um, let's see if I can get this working. Have you used chat GPT lately? Questions like this signal, the increasing presence of AI in our tech heavy world. AI, generative AI, artificial intelligence is, is all the rage these days. Uh, uh, do you know what the biggest challenge with AI is today? It's power, energy. I was at a conference on this topic the other day, apparently, the power required to program the 175 billion parameters in ChatGPT runs over a gigawatt. Just by contrast, the human brain consumes 25 watts of power for similar operations. That is quite a chasm to cross. But one way to begin to address the power challenge is to convert data transmission to optics. Data communications over optical fiber using light as the carrier dominates because it's 10 times faster, uses 10 times less power, and produces much less heat than electrons flowing through copper. Nothing else can do what photon photonics can do to increase bandwidth and speed while reducing latency and power consumption. So what does PUT do? Poet makes optical modules that enables optical data transmission. And this is fundamental to scaling the presence of AI. Others make optical modules as well. But Poet has developed unique intellectual property that allows us to make these modules better, cheaper, lower power, and larger scale than anyone else. More than cost or bill of sales, it is the scale where Poet shines. And by scale, we mean the number of units that can be economically produced. Poet has semiconductorized photonics packaging and put it squarely on the same trajectory as semiconductors. Semiconductorization of photonics using Poet's proprietary optical interposer provides unprecedented scale and economies for the rapidly growing AI and optical communications market. In fact, it's our belief that it's not possible to address these markets that need hundreds of millions or billions of these devices any other way. Integration is the key. Semiconductorization is the key. And we believe we have pioneered this art of semiconductorization of photonics packaging. And that means terrific potential in a large, growing, and increasingly relevant market in AI and co-packaged optics. We have come a long way over the past year with many accomplishments under our belt. We serve a very large market worth billions of dollars, particularly in data communications and AI. We're squarely in the supply chain for AI hardware. We have a super unique and patented technology that provides us with a source of sustained competitive differentiation across a number of market verticals, including AI and high performance computing. We have an exciting product roadmap born out of six years of technology and product development. We have partnered with some of the largest optical companies in the world, like Lumentum, Broadcom, Maycom. We have a pipeline of customers across the world and design wins that could total more than $150 million of revenue over a three-year period. We have a majority stake in a manufacturing joint venture that could alone 
have an asset value of over 200 million over the next two to three years. The prime motivator for optics and data communications and AI is power and latency. Light, as we have mentioned, is 10X faster and 10X lower power and has ruled the roost when it comes to long distance data communications. In fact, Photonics 1.0, right, was driven by submarine communications, long distance communications, use optics as the medium for that communication to occur. However, as bandwidth, meaning the amount of information that is communicated per second keeps increasing, the distance over which this data is communicated with light has become shorter and shorter. Photonics 2.0, data centers, key driver for optics. So optics is now in data centers used for communications when distances exceed about five meters. With AI, the bandwidth and power crunch is so severe that there is now a need to utilize optics as a means to communicate data even between individual components like graphics and memory. The volume and scale of these AI applications quickly trumps the more conventional data center applications. And the greater the need, the greater we feel poet solutions in the space will begin to gain favor. AI is the killer app for Photonics 3.0. So the market for Poet Solutions spans the more traditional data centers and data communications, which includes, of course, enterprise and telecom applications, and the new and emerging market around AI-driven needs for optics. In fact, we believe the AI-driven needs are going to trump the more conventional um, you know, data center interconnects. That has really been kind of the prime driver for the past decade. Both of these markets are large and growing. They exceed $12 billion in TAM by 2025. The inflection point for growth in these markets begins next year. And POET is well poised with both solutions and customer access this year. And we're well positioned to intercept this market at the right time with our differentiated solutions. So the key challenges in photonics, especially when it comes to very large scale in terms of volume, um, is really you know, the ability to build millions, billions of these devices and conventional photonics packaging technology simply will not fit the bill. I mean, those solutions have been designed and have been developed and honed over 30 years, but they were first designed for single channel applications. Then they were designed for quad applications where the base technology was scaled through engineering. But today the applications demand eight channels, 16 channels. They demand hundreds and millions of units a year, not millions of units a year. And there comes a point where these conventional technologies simply cannot fit the bill. Absolutely possible to engineer in prototype quantities, but try to scale that with good economy, economies and economics. And that's where Poet comes in. Our vision has always been wafer scale integration of known good dye components that address the pinch points of volume, size, cost, power consumption. These are the areas where we believe our technology ticks the boxes consistently. And that is the beauty of what Poet has invented, which is the optical interposer. The optical interposer enables what we call chip scale wafer level packaging. In the world today in semiconductors, wafer level chip scale packaging is the norm. You look at your cell phones, you look at these devices that are in high performance com computing, they're all built with wafer level chip scale packaging where 
discrete electronics die are put together into a chip scale package. TSMC would call it COVOS. Uh, Intel calls it EMIB. But basically it's wafer level chip scale packaging. We're the first company in the world to adapt to wafer level chip scale packaging to photonics. So now instead of just integrating electronic dye, we're able to mix and match photonics and electronics dye on a wafer scale packaging platform. That's what we call the Pullet Optical Interposer. And we've been successfully deploying these interposer based solutions into a number of products after basically having developed the platform initially. The benefits to customers are of course in cost, size, scale, and, and power consumption. You know, we believe, especially as you go forward in, you know, um, in high frequency data communications, uh, the RF performance benefits of an optical interposer result ultimately in lower power consumption. Of course, there's the big conversion of copper to optics. <laughs> that is a big piece of that too. More importantly with the optical interposer is that our customers who adopt interposer-based engine solutions can lower their capex built by, by a factor of 10 because we do all the integration onto the optical engine. That is kind of cut both ways for us, right? Um, you know, on, on the one hand, new and upcoming module makers that have not invested in that CapEx, you know, really love it because they take advantage of this huge reduction in CapEx from their perspective to adopt our solutions. But on the flip side, you know, bigger, larger, well-established module makers that have already invested in warehouses of capital and warehouses of people, um, it's a little bit more difficult for them to switch, right? And continue and ad adopt a solution that largely eliminates a lot of their value, which is putting it together by bu buying an integrated solution from Poet. So, so that has cut us both ways. I mean, it's, it's, it's learning for us as we go forward, you know, in our progress, right? Uh, but I think what is clear is, is the value proposition that the technology has overall. Uh, and that's the platform the technology that we've developed, which also provides versatility uh, for a number of multiple applications. From a manufacturing standpoint, um, we've established a joint venture. We worked with Sana and IC in 2019. Um, it was important for PUT to ensure that there was a high volume manufacturing path for its optical engine solutions. As a small company, we leveraged other people's money in this context. We created a joint venture. PUT did not has not invested a dime in creating this joint venture manufacturing capability. Not a dime. We've provided know-how, no IP, and we've leveraged that know-how to create a manufacturing asset, a clean room, equipment, people. That's what's required to ultimately scale up the technology. And as a small company, we've been able to leverage Sana, and Sana is the world's largest provider of compound semiconductors in terms of LEDs. They recently launched a $3.2 billion joint venture with ST Microelectronics to do silicon carbide chips. I mean, these guys know manufacturing. And, and they want you know, this joint venture to be successful, and they've been investing into it. This joint venture now takes our optical interposers and converts them into optical engines through wafer level assembly technique. And these optical engines are then sold to optical module makers, and in some cases back to Poet, where Poet makes the end module. A word on superphotonics. It's, it's, it's a latent value that we have created in this company that we believe doesn't get enough recognition for what we've been able to deliver. Uh, it was a joint venture. We formed it in 2020 uh, between Poet and Sinai IC, just as COVID was breaking out. 
Its mission is to assemble, test, package, and sell optical engines. Based completely on Poet's optical interposer technology. We formed the company in 2019. It's a Chinese company. It was independently valued at 50 million US dollars at formation. For Poet, it enables a fab light manufacturing model with no investment by Poet. I mean, we spend all our cash in R&D. Somebody else is enabling us to scale it into manufacturing. If poor them ourselves, we had to set up that manufacturing entity, we would have had to raise so much more money to be able to create this capability, but we didn't. We created a joint venture, we got a partner involved, and they have now invested $10 million and change. They're committed to investing another $15 million to scale this up over the next six months. We've employed 38 employees. They've been able to take our technology prototypes that we've been developed in Singapore and demonstrate scale and yield and, and capability that, that is truly impressive. In fact, I was there, uh, what, six weeks ago? First time ever uh, since we formed the, the joint venture um, as, as China has now opened up and, and we're able to travel freely with our old visas. Terrific stuff. The goal for the Superphotonics joint venture is to IPO in China in 2026, 2027. Uh, we currently own an 80% equity stake in this joint venture. At the time of IPO, we would probably be closer to 50%. Even today, there is strong interest from China-based PE firms in owning a piece of Superphotonics. And valuations for photonics in China are huge. Valuations for photonics in China for innovative technology is even bigger. And once that innovative technology starts turning revenue, that valuation skyrockets. We believe that this joint venture could be worth 200, over $200 million in the next couple to three years, as soon as super photonics start generating revenue in significant in, in, in amount, which we think will be in a couple of years. I mean, that is just absolute latent value that we have created. And our ability to capture that value is to be able to sell our equity stake in that joint venture that provides a non-dilutive source of financing for the company to do other things, more R&D, more products. So we think that, you know, we're sitting on, um, on, 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 on really great value. And, you know, I commend, Vivek and team uh, for their efforts and being able to set this up and, 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 and for the, the overall poet organization to support creating what we believe is a very high value um, capability for the company going forward. Our line of optical engines, I mean, this is what they look like. Uh, if you guys have seen semiconductor chips, you will know what I'm talking about. These are photonics sub-assemblies. They look like semiconductor chips. On the left uh, are our 800 gig receivers as well as transmitters. We announced just two weeks ago that we are starting to sample our alphas of a 400, 800 gig scalable transmitter. First of the kind in this industry. First company to use DML lasers and generate 400 gig, 800 gig capability. In fact, when we presented the data to Lumentum, they acknowledged that we are the first company that they have sold these DMLs to, that have actually transformed these DMLs into a working product for them. And we did prototypes at the OFC. We are doing samples now and six months later well on track to our, with our roadmap to be able to take this into production early next year. On the extreme right-hand side, you see our product. This is specifically for ADVA. Again, first of the kind in the world. A full chip on board implementation of a 16 lane architecture that fits inside of a QSFP DD form factor. It's a 16 lane product. ADVA didn't have any other path to making this. We were the only choice. 
They're actively architecting this. They have a customer base that is keenly awaiting this product to be made available to them. And so we're, we're stoked. I mean, we're, in this particular case, we, we made this product line happen through our innovation. And these products are now ready and basically awaiting Adva to have their module design completed so that you know, they can take it into production. And there's obviously a, a lot of motivation on their part to do that given um, the uniqueness of the solution in the market. We're also the first company to do wafer level remote laser solutions for co-packaged optics and AI. Our product release plans for 2023 and 2024, we, we have come a long way. About a year ago, we were demonstrating 100 gig products. One year later, we're demonstrating 800 gigabit products, sampling 800 gigabits today. We've released our 100 gig receiver as well as transmitters. And we have three additional variants on the 100 gig. One is the what we call POET1 or the fully integrated single chip TXRX solution. This is gonna be a product that we're gonna take into the telecom market in China with our customer BFYY and their end customers, the likes of China Mobile and so that will be released at the end of Q3. We also have LR4 products, not just the one we did for Adva, but you know, conventional LR4, uh, that there are at least four customers that we're sampling to today. Again, will be released in Q3. We completed our beta for our 200 gig products. That'll be released in Q3 as well. 400 gig receivers have been released, 800 gig receivers and transmitters, end of the year. You can count the number of products we're gonna be releasing this year. It is insane, but it's possible because of you know, our, our interposer technology, the platform approach, the fact that we use known good components, and the moment we've been able to ally with some of the top optical component suppliers, we've been able to demonstrate the value that the engine provides in this context, which is converting a DML laser into an engine with good RF, right? In enhanced capability. And what POET would like to do is to be able to generate modules for 800 gig, which is critical, not just for data communications like Custom modules for in 800 gig are also used extensively in AI. On the other side, we have you know a, a set of remote light source products that we are still developing. I mean, I think our goal is to be able to really expand our portfolio in the space with key investments that we want to be able to make, where we believe that we have the ability to really make a, 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 a very meaningful contribution in this growing market of artificial intelligence, not just because we might have extremely differentiated DML-based 800 gigabit modules, but also very differentiated remote light source. We've been really busy as a company. Year to date in 2023, we've announced Key engagements with customers, Adva, Luxshare. Luxshare is a billion dollar company, right? They sell primarily to Apple and others, and they've got a business and an, and an access to the hyperscale market. We're designed in already with their 800 gigabit solutions with our receivers. In fact, we've gotten initial POs, right? These are Sample quantity POs, which 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 is which is common uh, early in the in the in the development where we provide engines for them to be able to develop their modules. BFYY, our first foray into telecom, the exposure into a really large market there, which which are the mobile players, the big mobile players in the telecom space in China. The Poet Infinity product line. We announced our engagement with Celestial, 
with this new class of products for their applications, we've received a purchase order from them for supplying product next year. And we also announced some product announcements, right? Uh, around the lines of infinity, announced the availability of these products sampling of, of 800 gig. It has been a busy year. And, and we expect, you know, that as we release more products over the next couple of quarters, to be able to announce additional customers, additional engagements. And then we do believe that we can keep up with what needs to be done in terms of kind of gaining traction and gaining engagement around this, this platform. We have 11 current projects with seven key customers. Um, and just these projects represent a combined $150 million of revenue potential over three years. Just these products, nothing new. But we do expect something new, right? We, we've got another, a bunch of products that we're planning to release over the course of the next couple of months. And we do believe that when those products are released, there will be more take up, more engagements, right? But based on what our customers tell us about these products, and when they intend to ramp and their potential forecast for these products, we estimate that for Poet and Superphotonics, this can be a cumulative $150 million of revenue potential, right? So if they're successful, we're gonna be successful too. And it's important for us to project and plan because we need to have the manufacturing capability to be able to deliver this. And that's where super photonics comes in and that's where the additional investments from Santa are gonna be placed. Today, our technology and business strategy is fundamentally centered around building interposers and optical engines and providing expertise to end customers or module makers to provide finished modules. While we believe that this is a reasonable model for kind of the legacy, if you will, or 100 gigs or 200 gigs or 400 gigs, especially in the AI segment, you know, we think we have to transcend beyond the optical engine and create optical modules. So the future for Poet is to actually create optical modules. And we believe we can do that because a big portion of the optical module is already factored into the engine. We've integrated TIAs, we've integrated drivers. We've got very good RF capability on the interposer. We've got all the photonics components on the interposer. We create effectively everything except the DSP. So our intent is to add a third set of capabilities for design and development of these optical modules. Uh, we're already doing it for AI. It's, it's a critical requirement for AI. So our intent in AI is clearly to have optical modules generated. So it doesn't mean that we're going to sell engines to module makers. I think in the advanced technology, specifically for AI, our intent would be to create optical modules. It enables the sale of our leading edge products directly to the end customer without having to go through this middleman and this long process of getting designed in and the iterations associated with more development to be done along the way. It reduces time to market, eliminates qualification cycles. We think it's the right thing to do. It requires some investment and we're looking at a, you know, an alternate joint venture capability that allows us to potentially fund this activity. Again, you know, raising money with some non-dilutive financing here. In 2020, when we created the joint venture in China, you know, China was in fashion. I mean, we were complimented for having done that. You know, today I read the boards and, you know, of course, everybody barfs on the fact that we have manufacturing in China, but it is important to understand that it is a very, very, very large market. It is in fact, the largest market for optics 100 to 400 gigabits per second. 
But we recognize that things have changed. Um, there are geopolitical issues. Um, there is likely to be more and more constraints in high end in AI, in AI solutions. And so we intend to create an alternate joint venture outside of China and follow what we would call a China plus one strategy, which a lot of customers require or demand, where we have a foot in China to support kind of the Chinese market with China components. And then we have kind of, you know, the, the ability to, to be able to manufacture outside of China as well. So we're actively seeking, as I said, an additional JV partner to provide a source of independent financing for this. This is critical to Poet's future. And we believe we can be very, very successful in this endeavor. I'm sorry, my uh, ability to move the slides is somewhat delayed. Uh, we've done a fair bit on the investor outreach front. Um, you know, our goal was to increase awareness of Poet so audiences likely to invest with a focus on the U.S. We've taken various steps to do that. Some popular, some not so popular. But the results speak for themselves. We've had a 300% growth in monthly website visits from December to June. 100% month over month visit growth from May. Three to one US visitors to Canadian visitors, which was a big thing, right? We wanted to get more presence in the US. Our NASDAQ volumes are finally higher than TSX Venture and has been up since December. So we will continue to tack and adapt, of course. You know, not everything that we do works beautifully. We have a path, we have a vision, we want to get something done, but you know, as with everything else, you have to tack and adapt. And we are, but, but the results speak for themselves and we will continue to drive this going forward. So in summary, we've created an innovative patented optoelectronic integration platform technology. We believe we're the only known technology that can meet the vectors of volume, size, cost, power for future photonics products, especially in large high growth markets, including datacom, telecom, and AI hardware. We are partnered with some of the leading companies in the optical communication supply chain. We're engaged with several key customers now that allows us to demonstrate the technical acceptance of our solution. I mean, we are after all doing something that has not been done before. We are after all creating products are, that are first of its kind in the industry and there's some degree of healthy skepticism about whether we can actually do it. And that skepticism first is, can it be done technically? Then it's, can it actually meet specs? And then it's, can you actually scale this in volume? And we're going through that process. Superphotonics is critical to enable market acceptance of our optical engine products. We're doing that today. They're ramping up. We have a revenue pipeline on customer engagements that provide $150 million of three-year estimated revenues based on their projections to us, of course. There's no guarantees, but you know they know their business, they know their customers, and they believe that they can represent to us what it would mean to us with this engagement. We expect Revenue to begin in 2024, but of course we will have production orders this year. We already do for the first half of next year, $3 million from BFYY. We expect POs this year as well. In fact, Superphotonics does have POs, but like I said, these are quantities that enable our customers to design their modules in. 
although our engines are ready, you know, we can't ramp into production till our customer, or in this case, Super Photonics customer can ramp their solution. And in some cases, there have been some delays because they've never used optical engines before. And so it's a learning process for them as well. So we kind of go through that. I mean, it's, you know, there, there, there are changes and, and to our roadmap, sometimes out of our control. You know, our products are ready and available and sampling and providing to the customers. And then we just have to work through the process of getting them designed in. And I think we're, the lights at the end of the tunnel, we can see it. We, we work with these customers and, and we do believe over the next couple of quarters that, um, that we should, or super photonics should be able to start, start their ramp, right? And, and, and most significantly, we've created a significant value capture potential with super photonics in terms of its asset appreciation and what that can mean to put in terms of non-dilutive financing to the company. We need it, right? We need the financing to be able to keep our roadmap, to drive our leadership in a sense in the AI space, to really take advantage of our existing position and grow it. And, and, and we think that this is a very, very critical piece of you know, how, how that can happen in, in the long term. So with that, you know, let me close. And, and I thank you for your time. I thank you for your attention. I thank you for your support. Go put. Okay, Kevin, so I think I hand it over to you at this point. All right, okay. I'll jump in. I think uh, Suresh with some questions uh, from uh, from the from the group. At uh, good uh, go poet indeed. Uh, tell us uh, what your objectives were with the ATM or at the market financing that was announced this morning. Oh, sorry. Um, I think I was. I might have made a been on mute. Uh, can you repeat that? Because it just didn't sure. come through clearly on my end. Sure. Uh, tell us what your objectives were with the ATM or the at the market financing that was announced this morning. Ah, uh, yeah. The, the ATM or at the market program, you know, it gives port management the flexibility to raise capital in small amounts over the course of the next year. Um, I think there's uh, a lot of misunderstandings um, associated with the mechanics of how ATM works. So I will shortly kind of ask Tom to maybe step in and, and paint some color and, and provide some, some guidance there. Um, but as, as the ATM itself, it's the least costly method for the company to raise capital in the public market. Low commissions compared to public offerings, no warrants attached, you're basically selling shares at market price, no discounts. So the ATM programs have been common among issuers in the United States for several years and have become much more popular now, recently in Canada. And we believe that an ATM is an essential part of a financing strategy of a high growth technology-based company. But you know the mechanics of the ATM is, I guess misunderstood. And um, so perhaps Tom, you might want to take a few minutes to explain how the mechanics work. Sure, I'd be happy to Suresh, thank you. Uh, what I want to emphasize first is, is that this is not a $30 million financing that we're doing today or any time in the, in the near future. It's very much misunderstood as being that. It's a facility that allows us, the company, to sell shares at the market price. And we're, it's a heavily regulated transaction. So we're, we have to be cautious about whether our intervention or our sale of shares into that market moves the market at all. Um, so, we're intending over the course of the next 12 months to take advantage of high volume days in which we believe we can sell poet shares at a reasonable and appropriate price. And the way that that happens is the 
there were two investment banks uh, that were named in the prospectus. One is Craig Harum in the United States, who many of you know, uh, follows us through Richard Shannon, uh, their analyst in the optics area. And uh, in Canada, Cormark, that has been an investment bank for us for a couple of uh, transactions, few transactions over the past couple of years. So I have access to a particular trader at each of those desks. And we convene early in the morning and see what the market activity is going to be, project what we think the market activity may be during the week. And we determine at that time whether or not we're going to be selling any shares into the market. We are totally in control of the price at which we sell shares and the number of shares that we sell. And so having that kind of facility around allows us to raise capital in the public market, as Suresh said, at the lowest cost. It's a 3% commission rather than a 7% commission. And there are no warrants and it's at the market. So we're not really you know, competing against um, others to, to who wanna buy or sell our shares. So it's important to remember that this is a facility that we have that we're completely in control of. It's been very common, as Suresh said, in the United States for a long time among most issuers. And in Canada, because they've relaxed the rules somewhat over the last two years, it's becoming more common. And I think you'll see it in uh, many other issuers uh, up in Canada. So we're going to be we're going to be looking at both markets over time. And as I said, we're, um, we have to be very cautious about not moving the market in any way. And I'm sure that the uh, regulators will be watching that over the course of the next 12 months. Um, hmm. Okay. So thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Tom. Thanks, uh, Suresh, <clears throat> for on, on giving us some background on that. Uh, following on the same topic, how does the company plan to fund itself for the next six to 12 months while ramping production? And does the company need or plan to raise additional capital before the end of 2023, beyond what you've already mentioned? Yeah, I put current stage, we're continuously evaluating the capital required to operate the business and execute on our ongoing strategic initiatives. Um, as part of this process, we're actively considering several potential alternative, non-dilutive means of bringing in additional capital. Um, as mentioned in the presentation, we believe that our equity in SPX is a valuable asset that is not obvious in our financial statements. And we have been approached by private equity companies interested in owning a piece of that operation, which both JV partners believe is a good prospect for an IPO in China. So once SPX begins to generate revenue, we expect its value to increase exponentially. In addition, in connection with our plan to sell modules, we believe that there are good opportunities to form additional joint ventures. Um, if we were to create a new JV for module production, we would expect to structure it uh, in a way to both provide capital to Poet and also to allow us to consolidate its results in our financial statements. Okay, and um, uh, moving on to uh, a question on some of our early adopters, our early customers. Uh, when uh, when do we expect to be in production or have received initial orders uh, from Adva and FiberTop for some of the Poet legacy uh, that um, they, they're contracting? Yeah. <clears throat> As I said, I mean, you know, I think initial orders, we've had it, we've delivered it, that's the X has rather. Um, you know, I think the, the, the key thing is, you know, how quickly can they complete their module design? And, um, and it's gone through some iterations. Um, you know, these are, these are companies, I mean, not used to working with optical engines. In the case of Adva, it's, it's uh, I mean, like I said, 16 channels in a, in a QSF PDD, never been done before. Um, so they're going through some learning curves on their end, right? Our designs are complete, the product's ready. 
Um, but we believe they're close and, and they do have an end market that they can sell into. Their customers are waiting. So there's motivation and vested interest on the part of them to finish their module design. We expect that this happens o- over the course of this quarter, uh, honestly. Um, I think now that we have the ability to travel to China, and I believe Raju is there next week, you know, we're going to be able to get much better engagement with them and, you know, hasten their development in the case of Fibertop, for example. But but Adva is, I mean, they're engaged. We've got weekly meetings. Um, it's hard to project and predict exactly when they're going to ramp. You know, I mean, this is this has been our challenge as well. And that, you know, our product's ready. Uh, we will release it at the end of this coming quarter in Q3. But does that mean it ramps immediately? Probably not, but it's not very far. And and for sure, it's not a question of if and when, but, but rather when. The opportunity is there. The value potential is there. Um, we just need to, we need our customer in a sense um, to begin their ramp, which, which we do expect uh, to happen in 24. With, like I said, initial production will start at the end of this year, but but really the the, the meaningful production will be in 2024. Um, but that's you know largely given their schedule, right? I mean, it's 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 hard for us to kind of really push that on, on our end uh, aggressively. I think the best we can do is to release the product and have it available and you know work with them closely, which is what the team's doing um, to enable their design to be completed. Okay, ter- terrific. Uh, on to a couple of questions or back to the stock price as a topic. Uh, two questions on that. What strategy is being employed to attract new institutional investors and what gives you the confidence it will be effective? Look, I mean, over the past 18 months, I think it's yeah about, about the time we kind of moved to the NASDAQ um, or about the time Russia invaded Ukraine, whichever way you look at it. Um, we have participated in nine Wall Street-focused conferences targeted at institutional retail investors in the U.S. We have we remain engaged with and distribute all announced business developments with a sizable number of institutional investor targets, which are continuing to follow Poet's progress. We've also stayed actively engaged with multiple sell-side research analysts including our existing covering analysts, such as Richard Richard Shannon at Greg Hallam, who initiated last year and has continued to provide Poet with much broader exposure. He's highly recognized in the industry. He covers Lumentum and some of the larger companies, right? So he, he knows what he's talking about, and I think he's respected and recognized. Additionally, we have been driving increased visibility through participation and presentations at industry trade shows. I think just this week, um, we, we had a, a, a video that was actually in Chinese created by Mo, you know, that, that got a lot of inbound traction um, when it was published uh, at the industry trade show there. So this all contributes to elevated awareness, not just among customers, but but also tech-oriented investors. Okay, and what else is the company doing to increase the current sh- uh, share price? Look, as shareholders ourselves, um, we're always looking at new ways to support our stock price and attract new investors. Our top priority as a management team is to create shareholder value through continued execution on our business plan and begin generating a sustainable and growing revenue stream. To the extent that we are successful in capturing even a portion of the available market opportunity, we believe the stock price will ultimately reflect that value appropriately. To help further expand our investor outreach efforts, in January, we retained Stockhouse to help execute an advertising and marketing campaign that has seen increased interest through website visitation, as well as expanded awareness via newsletters and digital marketing. Then in April, we engaged HE Capital Markets for distribution of our company's content on Investors Hub and Wall Street Silver Services. We also continue to actively participate in Wall Street-focused events, conferences, 
speaking opportunities. So one thing I'd like to point out is that COVID stock is up what, over 40% year to date. And even over the past 12 months, we've kind of meaningfully outperformed a large majority of publicly traded micro cap tech companies. It's not been a, an easy market, folks. Um, but, you know, there's, there's still dissatisfaction, obviously. And, um, you know, but what, what we can do is, is manage what is on our control. And that is execute our roadmap, which we've been doing. And you've seen it, you know, we've provided our roadmap and we periodically give you updates and we're on track. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you think uh, then, Suresh, based on this activity, that Poet's valuation should be now based on the progress that you've outlined, what we've made uh, this year? I, I don't think it's, a, it's, it's my job to comment on, on valuations, so I, I don't think I'm going to answer that question. Okay. Um, and let's, uh, let's have one here on, uh, the, when can we expect to see additional buying and or exercising of warrants by insiders? Look, I mean, I think most of the warrants are, are done. There's probably a single tranche of warrants left in August. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, I, I, I like like I said, I don't I don't control what other management members or the board do in Poet. We're all independent um, folks. Um, so yeah, I, I I don't think there's uh, a lot more warrants left, honestly, to be exercised, and we we'd like to keep it that way going forward too. Okay, and and with the stock trading where it is today, how committed is management and the board to resisting a potential unsolicited buyout offer at an attractive valuation? Oh, um, and you know, look, um, our our. Our interest is is in building, you know, long term shareholder value, and um, and so you know, I think we're uh, we we recognize and understand the value we bring, and we recognize and understand the value um, that is achievable, and so you know, I I don't think this is a concern that existing shareholders need to have. I think, you know, we all collectively are vested in doing what is necessary to drive uh, shareholder value at, at valuations that we believe uh, accurately represents uh, what we offer uh, in the industry, right? And what we offer to this large and growing market, uh, especially in AI. Okay, and uh, we have a question here um, about uh, uh, competitors, both, uh, well, let's go with N NVIDIA. Are they the, currently the kings of the AI market? How could Poet uh, enhance their offering? Look, I think, you know, and I mean, NVIDIA are the kings in the AI market because they create, uh, you know, highly parallel computing infrastructure with their GPUs and then, you know, they tie it up with, with large amounts of memory and, and sell these DGX boxes at $30,000, $40,000 a pop. Um, but, you know, I think going forward, I mean, you know, I think data center servers are going to incorporate NVIDIA graphics processors and so on and so forth. So, yes, they're, 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 they're a graphics company. There are kings there. Um, I think how Poet helps is, um, is by providing, you know, the means to communicate either between graphics and memory or by providing the means to communicate between servers. Um, and, you know, today, much of that is done either by, you know, 800 gig, kind of transceiver modules. They look like transceiver modules, but they're kind of custom specifically for AI. Um, or um, they can take the form of photonic fabrics um, and, and other such uh, applications that there are other companies kind of driving. And so, so the AI segment is kind of bifurcated, right? One is there's just a growth or a need for a lot of optics. 
and that is bifurcated into kind of transceiver like form factors which we play into and then into photonic fabric like fa form factors with new companies and upcoming companies that again we play into by providing remote light sources so i think we're um, we're well covered uh, in terms of what we can do and um, and are actively working to intercept this very large growth market over the next couple of years Okay, of the uh, 11 current uh, contracted uh, projects that you uh, stated uh, having today, which one or two represent the largest near-term revenue opportunities? I guess this is specifically with our products and our customers. And what are the remaining steps to convert these opportunities into revenue? Well, I mean, I think for most part, these are committed projects. I mean, I think we're going through the development phases in the case of companies like Celestial and their projected volumes to us. I mean, you know, th those are products that are committed and we have POs, we have to deliver uh, the teams working on, you know, finishing up that design by the end of this year. And, you know, we have a PO to deliver a certain number of those uh, engines by, by the end of 2024 for, you know, kind of a larger ramp next year. Um, so in most of those, except for one, I believe, uh, which is still, um, you know, in evaluation by the customer, um, there, there are commitments to use the products they are designed in. So then it's it's not to me a question of if then, it's a question of when, and that when depends less on poet's readiness than more on our customer's, you know, ability to convert that into a module design and then ultimately take it and, and be successful in the market. Um, but you know, on a on a balance, you know, I think we're well positioned there with with uh, really good potential. Okay, and uh, <clears throat> regarding Air Labs, do you view them as a competitor or a potential partner? Neither. I view them as a as a customer, a potential customer. Um, I mean, they, they they are one of the companies that have a photonics fabric. Um, they also require a remote light source, and we believe we have a good technical solution. Um, and uh, there have been dialogues and discussions, and we hope at some point that we can convert that opportunity into into you know a real engagement. Uh, and with uh, uh, sticking with the products and uh, the uh, optical interposer, how far behind are competitors to what the optical interposer can do? I'm sorry, I think you have to repeat that question, please. How far behind are the competitors to uh, the optical interposer and what it's able to deliver to the market? Look, I mean, I have yet to see, I mean, I've, I've said this publicly before, I think the only company that had, you know, capability uh, or at least a vision uh, very similar to what Poet was discussing and talking about was Rockley Photonics. Um, you know, the, they ultimately were not successful in creating these products and data communications. I mean, we've we've successfully sampled 800 gig receivers. I mean, you know, we 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 we've done we've we've come a long ways relative to what others thought they could do, but couldn't ultimately do it. Um, now, outside of them, mm -hmm. I'm not seeing too uh, many uh, solutions. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Uh, no, that's good. That's uh, 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 regarding the light bar. Have other companies tested the light bar family of products and how are those samples um, being received and can we expect future announcements? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's a little bit of, I mean, ambiguity among the customer base, especially as it relates to co-packaged optics or, um, or remote lasers. Um, it is a very, very, custom market, it's a kind of a wild west right now. There's no there's no kind of standards. Um, you know, what IR Labs uses is something completely different. What Celestial wants is something completely different. What Light Matter uses is something completely different. Light Allegiance is completely different. I mean, they're all different, right? And so what, you know, um, in, in a sense, it plays to our strength because we've got a platform, we have the ability to adapt these solutions. 
Um, but, you know, it's also difficult because we keep sampling and talking to customers and they change their requirements and needs. Sometimes it's four channels, it grows to eight and then it's 12. And um, so, yeah, I think, you know, well, the good thing is we've got the right products and we've got the relationships and the engagement. Uh, and we do believe that, you know, as those requirements and needs develop and coalesce into something, uh, we will have the solutions available for them. Um, but um, today, our primary focus is, you know, ensure a successful deployment on Celestial AI. I mean, honestly, uh, if they are half as successful as they think they're going to be and have represented in their uh, forecast that I'm sure you can read up, um, you can see how lucrative just simply that is going to be for this company. Um, and then you add one or two. I think the intent is really not to go, we're not here trying to get numbers in terms of customers. We're trying to get wins, win with the winners, right? And, and, and we think if we can, you know, just convert a couple of them, um, these are really, really large opportunities ahead of us. And I've I've got one here on uh, that I know the the team is excited about the, the this application with film, thin film lithium niobate. Uh, can you comment on on that and how is that progressing? I mean, it's a technology of the future. You know, the important thing is that we have the ability to to incorporate new and upcoming components onto our interposer. Uh, but look, I mean, you know, Tenfilm Lithium Niobate is not going to be ready for prime time in terms of kind of commercial volumes for for it's at least three years. Um, so, you know, I think it's 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 something that we are engaged with in this case, you know, um, Liobate on and, and we're working with them in parallel. But, you know, we've also got to focus on products that, you know, we know are imminently required. Um, so we are, you know, initiating our development programs around a 200 gig per lane EML based solutions that those are the most mature solutions for 200 gigabit per lane today. Um, lithium niobate will be there at some point, but you know, I think we, we need to, we need to work with components that are ready today um, and, and leverage them fast and rapidly you know, and not keep betting the farm on some future. Um, I think we made that mistake a year and a half ago with, so, you know, waiting for a silicon photonics modulator to be available and we lost a year on our roadmap and I don't think we're ready to make that mistake again. Uh, no, cer certainly not. And uh, lots uh, lots going on with, with the company. And that, 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 I don't see any more questions, uh, Suresh. So I'm just gonna throw it back to you for some closing remarks. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's uh, it, it's been a it's been a an, an exciting year so far. Um, you know, we've we've got a lot of work ahead of us for sure. Um, you know, we've had shareholders um, that have either expressed good satisfaction or dissatisfaction, and I'm hoping that we can all coalesce around the fact that you know we over the past five years have developed something that is new, that is unique. Um, you know, we're committed as a team to drive progress. We're committed as, as a team to ensure success. Um, and, and we do believe that, you know, um, we've got as a company the, 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 the products to be able to leverage this, um, you know, new and rapidly growing area of AI, which is going to provide tremendous opportunity to everybody in photonics, uh, including Poet, right? And and so, and you know, the good thing is we're well positioned to capitalize on it because it kind of plays to our strengths. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of stoked about that, looking forward to the future. Uh, and as always, thank you for your continued support. Very good. Uh, thank you, Suresh. Really appreciate the comments that uh, you made, and we appreciate the videos that were shown. I am sure the shareholders and participants and guests also uh, appreciate what was uh, disclosed and reported here today. So again, we want to express our gratitude to um, everyone who's participated 
And thank you to the Lumi platform for uh, making this available to us today. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of the meeting. Again, we want to extend our gratitude to you for your continued support. And we look forward to joining with you again at future meetings. Please have yourselves a good, safe, and uh, enjoyable Canada Day long weekend and July 4th long weekend. Thank you all.